Hello, and welcome. Um, welcome back to our watch along of Micro Live. Uh, if you haven't joined us before, welcome. Uh, I hope you enjoy uh, as we uh, watch together this uh, second series, episode one, after um, a bit of a break taken from it, about four weeks hiatus we had. So let's get into it. Let's see what wonderful delights of obsolete technology we can spot today. Hello and welcome to Micro Live, back with a new weekly series. This week we'll be taking a look at the ups and downs of the computer industry since we were last on the air. I'll be talking to Lynn McTaggart, the editor of Which Computer magazine, about the problems caused by some computer maintenance contracts. 1985. And I'll be so explaining. Oh, hello, Fred Horace. How to make your computer talk to you. That's Amiga say. Yeah, we're in 1985 now, so we're rocking through these years. Now, if a picture is worth a thousand words, the computer graphic must be worth a megabyte. Well, Wednesday to Friday next week sees Computer Graphics 85 at Wembley Conference Centre here in London. There's three days of nearly every type of computer graphics to see, from business and information graphics to animation and even the latest in holography. But the event of the week is the Computer Animation Film Festival, to be judged on Thursday night, when 50 films from all over the world vie for the title of Best Computer Animation of 1985. We've had a sneak preview of the mass of good entries. Okay, this one, Tom's before. Gears from Cranston Zuri Productions Inc. in Columbus, Ohio, seems to do the impossible. I have. Some other entries we yeah, Tom's Gears. Liked. That I'm sure it's on YouTube. It's the. Um, it's actually a very early demonstration of liquid metal in animation. Um, you know, like they used in Terminator 2, that sort of thing. But a very early example of it. Really cool. I'm mean, I'm positive it's on YouTube. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Early animation had such a such a unique look to it. Even when they got so many colours and stuff, it's such a unique style. Chris Wedge. I've heard that name. Definitely heard of Chris Wedge. This is cool, though, isn't it? Look at that elastic, elastic, elasticated. Those are. Oh, Chris Wedge. Yeah, Chris Wedge created Blue Sky Media or Blue Sky Studios. They made um, Ice Age. They made the Ice Age movies. Really cool. That was pretty cool. There was, there was a lot of al al elasticity. Is that the word I'm saying? Elasticity in those shapes. That was pretty cool animation. Entry to the Computer Animation Film Festival costs £25 a ticket, but we'll have more of those graphics for you next week and the details of the winners. The exhibition itself, Computer Graphics 85, is open to anyone aged over 18. It could cost you £5, but by special arrangement, it's free to anyone who says Micro Live at the ticket booth. Now, Mac. Well, over the last year, the computer industry has gone through one of the most traumatic periods it's ever likely to experience, from boom to doom. Household names like Sinclair and Acorn got in the most awful state. And only today, Acorn announced a record loss of 22 it million pounds. It really pounds. is the end of Acorn here. Even the industry giant IBM caught a cold. Like most things in this industry, it all started in America as Fref reports. Summer came early to New York this year. At least it did to computer retailers. They expected a drop off in sales, that's traditional. The home market booms at Christmas time, and schools and businesses buy most of their computers in the fall. But a drop off is one thing, a slump is something else, especially when it comes three months early. In March of 1985, IBM announced that it was no longer going to be manufacturing the PC Junior. For IBM, this is interesting how the massive slump happened, and it did affect the UK market, but. IBM said the home market was dead. Not quite so in the same the way. Um, temporarily. The people a lot of our small manufacturers had gone shock. by the wayside, and, and, and the sales have been slow for all we've of got the a couple of people, especially. a couple of companies surviving, like Commodore and Sinclair. 
A lot of stores hit hard times, too hard for some. I bought my PC at this store, came in a few weeks ago to buy supplies and found it Obviously, like this. Sinclair would go on to get purchased by Armstrong. So, you know. But here they at 47th Street Photo, an electronics cash and carry in Midtown Manhattan, very little in the way of dealer backup is offered, and so prices can be slashed. Have they found business slow? Uh, I don't like to say slow. They've changed. It's different than it used to be. It's, it's a uh, more serious buyer. The buyer's buying, you know, buying more merchandise when he walks in here. He's buying a more complete system. It's not that spontaneous, off-the-shelf, one-of-a-kind type thing anymore. It's a, it's a thought out, well thought out purchase. So what's ahead for America? Well, drastically falling prices, but even so, price and hardware are not what sell computers. Software sells computers. We've outgrown games here in America, and the real future belongs to the companies that can create new software products that meet the UK, practical needs. See, in the UK, we hadn't really outgrown games at all, well, had we? We were computer industry catching booming in that area. It wasn't long before pneumonia was rampant here. For some home computer companies, it proved fatal. Hardware companies, software companies, they were all being zapped like space invaders that had made them all rich. One man who is uniquely placed to know just how serious the shakeout is, is Bill Gates, the chairman of Microsoft. That's the company which wrote the software that's become the standard operating system on business micros. A multimillionaire at 29 with a software empire on both sides of the Atlantic, Look how embracing young business and home machines. <laughs> what does he make of oh, the last Benny. nine months? The home computer market is in very bad shape. The uh, current product uh, doesn't me. provide enough benefit to really to feel so old. keep on growing and, and selling to more homes. And uh, so a lot of companies expected growth and, and they're not finding any. In fact, in some cases, it's, it's shrinking. The office market is quite different. Uh, it's still growing very healthily. It won't double this year, but it'll grow by, oh, at least 30 to 40 percent. More electronic and computer companies have been floated on the stock exchange over the last three years than any other sector. They sailed through calm waters and cruised into massive profits. High-tech shares put on millions of pounds. A buoyant stock exchange gave no clue of the storms to come, nor of the financial lifeboats which would have to be launched. Some say the people here in the city were partially to blame for the wrecks. Suddenly, the darling of venture capitalists was jilted. If you look at a share like Apricot, something like 70% of the market capitalization has been wiped off so far this year. You had £100 invested on the 1st of January, that's down to £30 now. And I think the reason is not far to seek. It's been a very difficult period in terms of sales and in terms of profitability. To give you an idea of that, in the second half of last year, that's June to December, uh, Acorn had really quite reasonable sales. In the first half of this year, just 40% of that was what they achieved. So that's the problem, and it's come through in terms of profitability as well. Apricot's chairman, Roger Foster. I think the, of course, the area that we at Apricot are in is very much the business area, and that's been pretty steady. There's been a degree of slowing down in the past few months, but only of the order of a slowing of growth. And I think that in the business section which we operate in, we shall continue to see 30% growth rates for the next sort of five years. It's in the home computer market that really... Yeah, the home I computer market had really had a massive downturn. The the day, and the so many little companies downturn, have just gone. And, we will not see a and some companies were down. still so still in trouble. To try and spell out the differences but between the two markets. it was the home market. enthusiastic when things were going on. We tend to lose our call quite rapidly. But in the end, it's down to profit. There was a bit of a double-edged sword, really, because you had Commodore and Spectrum doing all right. And they're even reporting losses. But that's so many others have really fallen by the wayside. And that's been the position recently. Do, do you think we're going to see some more casualties in the months to come? I think we will, yes. Names? Uh, particularly amongst the smaller companies, but I'd be a rash man to name them at the moment. There are many different ways of getting a micro to talk to you. Some machines, like this RML Nimbus, can even talk in your voice. Speech sample. This Nimbus works like a digital sound recorder. Earlier today, I used a microphone to record that sentence, and the Nimbus stored away some 8,000 samples for each second of speech. To speak, it just reads those samples back. Well, that's all very well, but what can it do that a £20 cassette recorder can't? Well, of course, a computer can decide what to say and when under the control of a program. For instance, this is a machine you might find in schools. Just imagine the potential for software that can do this kind of thing in the teacher's own voice. Well done, Katie. Uh. You've scored 9 out of 10. 
excellent quality. But 30 seconds of speech would use up about 128 kilobytes yes, of memory. Not very, very That's practical, the is it? Of about 50 pages all those of different four. variants, and different scores for all the different kids. School micro can offer. Not like on memory, so in it. How can you get intelligible speech using less memory? Well, it can be done, but you'll lose some of those human qualities. To begin with, you'll need one of these. It's a miniature synthesizer. It can make all kinds of sounds, oh, it but it's it's particularly it? designed to simulate the human Text voice. Text instruments? And you'll also need another chip to, to tell it what sounds to make. I'm this one sure. is a ROM, I think it is. only memory. And the data in here instructs this chip to make and spell. complete English words. Speak you'll and spell, not speech like and spell. Speak and spell. Speak and spell. Which How is ironic, I can't say toy. it. Obviously, it helps children with their spelling. But with different data in the ROM, <laughs> you can get your BBC micro to talk in Kenneth Kendall's cultured tones. 28, 30. Well, here's a program which creeper. is reading the temperature of the studio, and as you can hear, it's pretty hot in here. It's speaking it out. Well, that could be useful if you were running a scientific experiment and needed to keep your eyes on other things. Well, yes, thank you, Kenneth. That's great. With both the Speak and Spell and the Kenneth Kendall ROMs, the data is stored as complete words. So, the only words they can speak are the ones they come with. In this case, it's about a hundred. Fine for some uses, but for general applications, that could be a problem. Have you ever tried a conversation with just a 100-word vocabulary? Well, it can cramp your style. For more words, you'd need more chips. So, for a full vocabulary, the problems and the expense would be horrendous. The answer seems to lie not in whole words, but word parts. That is, component sounds of speech, which, when strung, strung together correctly, can be used to construct any English word. Things like sh, f, a, i, k, that sort of thing. These sounds are called phonemes, or in some situations, allophones. Oh, my word. And reasonable English phonemes. Just about 40 or 50 of them. Oh, my little girls coming home with phoneme cards at school. In a ROM, oh, any English word I'll take me back. By stringing together the correct sequence. And that's the approach that computer concepts have taken with their new software for the BBC Micro. Trying to teach a four-year-old or five-year-old to, to make phonemes words, sounds. you have to think about how they oh, sound, God. not how they're spelt. For example, here's part of a sentence that I'm working on at the moment. This is not as easy as it. Well, notice that is has been coded as I-Z. You see, otherwise the micro would say is. Well, I need the word sounds to complete that phrase, and the first phoneme is easy. That's just s, s. But the next sound is a bit of a problem. Ow! You see, there isn't a letter on the keyboard for ow. So, as ever, if all else fails, reach for the handbook. Well, here we are, and it's got a list of. Is <laughs> that the only one who got uh, this thing to uh, words they might say rude words? Example, I hope not. What rude words can we get to say today? Sound, that's the one I want, and that's coded <laughs> as A W. Fair enough. A W. <laughs> that's sow now n, obviously, and I think I can probably manage without that D because we don't say sounds, we say sounds. So Z to finish it off, and how's that? It is not as easy as it sounds. Oh, that's not too bad, <laughs> quite recognisable. Just a bit flat, something like a tame Dalek. Well, no problem. This system even allows some kind of emphasis. Let's punch that word sounds. That needs an asterisk in the right place. It is not as easy as it sounds. And notice how the inflection of all those other words is tailored to build up to sounds. Oh, yeah, you can do inflection. It is not as easy as it sounds. That's pretty convincing. The main problem is I had to translate each that's of cool. those words that into the equivalent. That works That takes a long time and a bit of experimentation. Of course, it would be great if the machine could speak from standard text and you could get your computer to read your electronic mail to you over the telephone. But that's a tall order, or to coin a phrase, it's not as easy as it sounds. Text-to-speech needs a system which understands the grammar, the sense and the context of words. Well, they haven't quite got there yet, but some systems are pretty close. Here are just a few add-on units. They each have software which applies simple language rules to the words to guess the pronunciation. Mm. And this Let's sentence see how is an acid it? test. Power mowers are thoroughly tough, though. Although those words look similar, we know that they're pronounced differently. But what do the computers make of it? First of all, this system here. <laughs> well, I'm not too sure about that. that oh dear. Thorough fly, but uh, the rest of it was all right. This is Should a class as a fail. 64 with an add-on unit at the back from Curra. It's the Curra Speech 64, and there it is. And it only costs about 30 quid. So really, um, I think at that price, it's yeah, a fly goodbye. 
Over here we've got a BBC Micro with yet another add-on. This is the Name Owl Type and Talk. And that sounds like this. Our are I'm sure we had one of those at school. Oh, well, it made some kind of sense of thoroughly, a little bit mechanical, I think. Sure, we but had one of those at school. Never used it, pounds, though. And that unit is compatible with most home micros. Over here, there's a much more expensive uh, piece of hardware. It's the ICL Professional unit, costing about a thousand pounds. And that sounds like this. Our are your early tough vote. No, not bad at all. That sounds very mm. confident, anyway. And finally. Those were all add-on units, but over here, there's the machine that set the industry buzzing. Everybody is saying that the Commodore oh, Amiga the is the machine of the future. And it's interesting that they've provided text-to-speech. Oh, I so like that unit. Our mowers are fairly tough, though. I think it was actually Pretty the good. first computer 12, to come with it built in. US dollars, but of course over here, you're oh, going to have come to with it as standard. Well, that test was none too serious, but to see how valuable this can be in practice, we've been to see one person who is using the speech system as part of his everyday life. You may remember him from one of our earlier series. Richard Gom is severely disabled. His only means of Richard's got a lot of nice kit. pointer attached Look to his that. head. He uses this to spell out letters. Over the past few years, the keyboard of his computer has been his lifeline. He's even used it to produce 80,000 words for a thesis for a doctorate in philosophy. A monumental typing task, even for someone who is a body. That 80,000 words is a lot. His latest link with the world is a Namel speech synthesizer. Hey. Which now means the guy that, there. to a limited yeah. extent, he can use the phone. There. A Tandata auto dial modem linked to a BBC micro gets him connected. Styling. For this call, he's that noise is so um. Oh, I remember it so well. Lord Haven. Four seven two. Hello. Is that the Hyper Yes. Hello, Richard. How are you? I am well. How are you? Oh. Yeah, oh, this well, it takes me back to when I used to work at T-Mobile. We used to get some people ringing in to customer services via this sort of system, and I used to find find it really hard to understand what they were saying. And the synthesizer software. And you feel guilty for asking them to repeat it. Using 400 speech rules and speaks down the line for him. Every time I access my floppy, it crashes. I think you've got well, to have a really good ear for this sort of stuff, and I don't know, my ears just weren't compatible. Typing other words letter by letter is very slow, and might make people ring off in frustration. So, he speeds things up by using some word anticipation software that he's written himself. Friday. Oh no, Friday's up. Um, have you got another day? It makes a guess at what he means from just a few letters. Thursday. And he uses single characters, or codes, for commonly used words. Goodbye. A really clever use, though. It's just how, how quick can you actually type a conversation? John Piper uh, is but Richard's friend. And like when I went to T-Mobile, I managed it you know, pretty well. System developing? He can now use the telephone and speak to anyone. But you still have the problem of the rate at which he can make his messages. One of the answers that we're looking at, or one of the possibilities, is the use of an extended keyboard such as this that gives him very quick access to a very much larger range of utterances that are possible with the conventional QWERTY keyboard. Well, to prove that it can even work on live television, we've oh got dear. Richard on the end of this phone. Hello, Richard. Well, you've described your system on our programme notes, but can people contact you to buy the software? Yes. Oh, gotcha. See, that's just, I can't understand what you're saying. Well, that wasn't bad. It, the, the line isn't quite as good as it was in the film. I, I, I'm, I think you said yes if they contact me through Micro Live. Well, what machines does the software work on? BBC and Apple II. Thank you very much, Richard. Goodbye. News. This is new. British micromakers are in Moscow to bid for Soviet government contracts. IT Minister Jeff 
Geoffrey Patty is told government cuts will hit youth training at information technology centres. And Apricot oh, moves towards IBM compatibility as they launch Zen. It's got a built in phone. A group of British micro makers is now in Moscow trying to persuade the Russian this government definitely a new to feature. buy British. The trade mission, led by ICL, will be demonstrating British microcomputers to more than 50 Soviet government departments, including the Education Ministry. The Soviet bloc is banned from buying the West's more sophisticated computers. I was just about to say, weren't they banned from buying Information computers Technology from the West? Information Technology Minister Geoffrey Patty has been told Obviously that these government cuts will cut hit high-technology training for young unemployed people. He was given the warning as he toured Blackpool's Information Technology Centre. It's claimed that government funding plans will hit some of the 170 centres. A spokesman for the Department of Trade and Industry says when the ITECs were set up, they were expected to be self-sufficient within three years. Apricot has launched a new business micro and for the first time offers some IBM compatibility. Called the Zen, the new top-of-the-range machine uses like 286 processors, Microsoft Windows, and is claimed to be four times faster than an IBM PC. Starting at just over £2,000, Apricot hope it will secure a slice of the lucrative top-end business market. It uses a 3.5-inch micro floppy disk, and its move towards IBM compatibility is achieved through an add-on 5-inch disk and emulator software. Nice. The machine follows the current trend of built-in telephone and communications software. It's made in Scotland and will be available at the end of the month. The battle over which microcomputer operating systems will be industry standard has taken a major turn, as Wendy Woods reports from California. The battle between IBM and AT&T heated up this week as AT&T introduced a micro which competes with IBM's phenomenally selling PC AT. The 6300 Plus runs Unix and IBM's PC DOS, the first machine ever to do so. But the fact that it's IBM compatible means that the telephone giant has thrown in the towel in trying to make Unix alone the new industry standard. This is Wendy Woods reporting from Silicon Valley for Micro Live. And finally, Japan says it will ban the export of computers to South Africa's police and armed forces because of the country's policy on apartheid. Thank you, Leslie. Well, a maintenance contract for your computer seems on the face of it a very good idea. If you are totally dependent on the computer data, you just can't afford to have blank VDUs. So worried corporate computer users find this kind of advert. Oh, computer very tempting. service agreements. Five percent of the cost of the system per year nationwide. Back in the mid eighties, it must have been the Wild West. Of computer servicing. Sounds good. Five percent is a third to a half normal charge. But when oh. David Greenhalgh of Sonet Offshore signed up with Sullivan's, he discovered that twenty four hours could be a very long time. Sullivan's standard contract reads very differently from their advert. To its best endeavours, Sullivan's will start equipment repair within 24 hours of the client's request. Sullivan's will install replacement loan units of standard equipment and at no extra cost. This installation is subject to availability. Sullivan's best endeavour for Sonat Offshore meant a fastest response time of two days. No replacement <laughs> machine for an IBM XT so changed now, obviously. for repair, then returned without its mains lead, and unfulfilled promises that engineers would call. In fact, Sonat became so dissatisfied that... What, what do you do now? Do you just take the Dell stuff, the, the in-house servicing? I mean, I'm not an IT specialist, so I wouldn't know. I mean, I know when I used to work at T-Mobile, they had it all in-house to a third-party company. Maintenance. We spoke to Sullivan's managing director, Chris Sullivan, who told us that he disagreed with the facts according to Sonat and was appealing against the court order. He also said that the Advertising Standards Authority had upheld one of the complaints simply because his letter of explanation had not arrived until the day of their decision. A London company who wants to remain anonymous were dissatisfied with the maintenance service offered by their computer supplier, Systime. Too late, they discovered that not a single word in their contract referred to Systime's obligation <laughs> to actually repair the machines. And when the company tried to get out of the contract, they discovered that Systime would expect a substantial cancellation fee for termination of a contract which has only run... Oh my God, that's years. so ambiguous. This month, Which Computer Magazine has a cover story about computer maintenance companies. And I've been joined by their editor, Lynn McTaggart. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Tell me, are these isolated cases or is it very common? It's very calm. 
Uh, to find out just how good the average maintenance contract is, we sent out questionnaires to 3,000 of our subscribers, and we were very surprised by the results because while some are victims of cowboys, almost everybody is a victim of the, of the fine print in contracts of otherwise reputable companies. There's all manner of escape clauses allowing these companies to get away with murder. I went through a few contracts and looked at them myself, and this one I think is quite a good contract. It says this company agrees to provide maintenance service to keep the equipment in good working order and condition and in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. Sounds reasonable. Now that sounds very clear and logical. But this other one says, the service shall provide both remedial and preventive maintenance. But didn't say what they're going to achieve by this. Is this Taking your money and run. In a respectable company? Definitely. Well, I think um, most contracts read like the latter. They very carefully specify response time um, when somebody's going to arrive, but they don't actually say that their job is to fix the computer. What this should they look for in a good contract then? Well, uh, what you have to avoid is, first of all, um, you have to have it clearly stated that um, they're supposed to come quickly and repair the equipment. Secondly, you've got to have your solicitor look, look over um, the length of contract, um, length of time it's supposed to run. Many contracts say that you can cancel at the end of the minimum period, let's say that's five years, or on the anniversary of the minimum period. This means it's actually a six-year contract. And if you miss the appointed day when you're supposed to do it, it's actually a seven-year contract. Then there's the term best endeavors. If ever there was an escape clause, that's it. What that means is that legally, um, they may use their best endeavors to fix your kit, but they don't actually have to get it up and running again. One of my friends was rather astonished when his son came in and said he got a job as a computer maintenance engineer, a microcomputer maintenance engineer. He asked what qualification have you got for this job because he knew he had none. He said, well, I have a driving license. All I have to do is drive there, <laughs> clean the disc and take the machine away if I can't understand it. He was totally without any qualifications. Is that the sort of tricks they play? Well, again, in the contract, it doesn't say anything about how good the engineer um, has to be. So if you're was just it really this bad it, back in 85? Saying, um, that he has to get there at a certain time, any yabo can show up with a screwdriver in his hand. And that actually does happen? Oh, yes, in many cases, yes. Well, tell me, how would you set about looking for a good maintenance company? Uh, I think, first of all, um, when you're looking into a maintenance company, ask for a list of their customers. And don't be afraid to ring them up and ask them about their service. Uh, become an informed consumer yourself, and to that end, which computer is giving away a free booklet this month um, that talks about avoiding these pitfalls. Finally, make sure your solicitor drafts the contract, not the maintenance company. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's cut you off. Very Move useful. on. And now, news of the first microlive of 1986. On January the 17th, the programme will come from the Witch Computer Show in Birmingham. And as well as a look at the show itself, we'll be featuring the presentation of the Microlive Ooh. Rita Awards. These awards, presented in association with the show's organisers, Carnes Exhibitions Limited, are designed to recognise achievement in British information technology. The How many years does those awards go for? Trophies, and there are six categories. Business Computer System, User of the Year, <laughs> Newcomer <laughs> User of, the of the Year, year. Personality of the Year, Systems Innovation and Software Product of the Year. If you've come across a company or a product... <laughs> I think one of my ex-girlfriends was awards, uh, awarded User of the Year award. by writing to <laughs> Rita Awards Administrator, 59 London Road, Twickenham, Middlesex, TW1 3SZ. And the closing date is the 28th of October. And finally, if you'd like more information about anything featured in MicroLive, there are programme notes available from a variety of sources. On CFAX, page 700, on Telecom Gold, just type Info BBC, and on the MicroLive Bulletin Board, that's 01579 That's at 300 board, incidentally. And if you don't have the technology, it will cost you 50p. It's at 300 you board. To the address which will be given after the programme. Well, that's all for this week. Next Friday, yeah, we'll it. have the winner of the Computer Animation Film Festival. As you can see, they're only and half an hour in length now. That'll really help my um, viewing then, time, won't it? Goodbye. Brilliant. <laughs>